So there's an advance in literacy. The literacy rate in Al-Andalus in the 11th century was around 80% of the population. I don't know that we have 80% literacy in 2019 in many, if you will, developed countries. So the fact that the Moors were promoting this idea that you need to learn to read and to think critically, pay attention to the world, find ways to improve upon it. The introduction of this into the madrasas, which would have been the schools, that later become the universities in Al-Andalus, which is, as I said, Spain and Portugal and in other areas. As a result, you have perhaps the earliest example, intercultural, interreligious exchange on a grand scale. Now here's what is also pretty significant to keep in mind. The religion of Islam is also, if you will, vying for converts. Right? Christians are instructed to go out and save people in the name of Jesus. Muslims are also looking to convert people by sharing the word in most cases, but in other cases, there are examples of people spreading the religion by the sword. That's just the reality of history. The only community that actually wasn't compelling converts would have been which? The Jewish community, that's right. The Jewish community. Because it's not necessary within the context of their own faith. But yet the Jewish community will do the best, to fare the best under Moorish domination than they would under the Roman Catholic Church. And up until the 18th century, in most Protestant nations as well. One of the other groups that you may not have heard of, but I like to mention them because I don't think I talked about them, I haven't talked about them much, I made a brief reference. Has anyone here ever heard of the Cathars or the Albigensians? Good. The Albigensians or the Cathars was a Christian community in southern France that had been influenced by their contacts with Muslims in the East, most of whom were Moors, but they weren't all Moors, because they had also had contact with the people, and started to adapt their faith in Jesus in a way that was at odds with the Roman Catholic Church. Is anyone familiar with the Gnostics? Yeah. Okay. So those who are familiar with the Gnostics, and you know, the Gnostics were about seeking knowledge through action. Right, it comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. The Gnostic community was one of the Christian communities right after the time that the man we know as Jesus walked the earth. And this Gnostic community, their interpretation challenged the Roman Catholic interpretation. They believed in reincarnation. Sound familiar? They believed in meditation. They believed in being vegetarians. They referred to the material world as having been usurped by a usurper god that they called Rex Mundi, which is just Latin for king of the world. Both women and men served as priests. Ultimately, they would be slaughtered by 
the Roman Catholic Church, led at the time first by someone named Pope Innocent III, initiated a massacre which started first in Bezerra in southern France. The significance of the Cathars or the Albigensians, which are rarely discussed, is that this is one of those European Christian communities that is influenced, I would argue, by their contact with the Muslim world and especially the Moors, because the Moors were the community of Muslims and Muslims who were the most, if you will, settled in Western Europe. But there would be a crusade launched against them between 1209 to 1229, which was meant to crush basically their presence because the Roman Catholic Church saw them as a threat at that time. And it's similar to another community also in Al-Andalus, in more of Spain, known as the Adoptionists, who said that Jesus was the adopted Son of God, which for theological reasons poses quite a threat in the context of traditional Christianity and certainly the traditional beliefs of Roman Catholicism. But that group, the Cathars of the Albigensians, represents one of these side groups in Western history that's showing you the influence of the Moors in Europe, but yet few people talk about it and give it any context when they do. You have a situation where the influence of the Moors is so great. Ninth century, this was a Catholic priest complaining about the influence of the Moors upon the Roman Catholic community that the Moors had, had essentially taken control of the region. He said, alas, all talented young men know only the language and literature of the Muslims, and they read and assiduously study, meaning, you know, like voraciously study their Arabic books. If somebody speaks of Christian books, they contemptuously answer that they deserve no attention whatsoever. Whoa. The Christians have forgotten their own language, and there is hardly one among a thousand who can write a friend a decent greeting in Latin." End of quote. That's correspondence in the ninth century telling you what was going on as a result of this Moorish presence in Spain, and not only in Spain, but then what would go on beyond that. Now, at the same time, if we jump ahead three centuries, here is now a Moor complaining about the transference of knowledge. Books of science ought not to be sold to the Jews or Christians, except those that treat of their own religion. Indeed, they translate books of science and attribute authorship to their co-religionists or to their bishops when they are the work of Muslims. 12th century, Ibn Abdul. Essentially what you have happening, right, is this presence is threatening the power structure that's in place. In the 10th century, now think about this in terms of modern day, one third, one third of the kingdom's revenue went to the public education system. So one third of all the taxes that were accumulated in the 10th century, that's the equivalent of 33, can you imagine if 33 cents of every dollar went to education? 
instead of what, 70 cents of every dollar going to the military industrial complex, as, as Eisenhower stated in his uh, presidential address before he left office, beware of the military industrial complex. He was a general, okay? But one third of the wealth of the country, of the kingdom, was used for public education. And the public education system was open to Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Anyone who entered the kingdom in peace could attend these madrasas, these schools. That's a powerful statement about the importance of knowledge. And it's the reason why other Moorish scholars like Ibn Hazm said, if you don't educate a child, essentially, in the sciences, history, theology, understanding the, uh, the, the Quran, you are leaving them at the level of a beast. Because man is made in the image and after the likeness of Allah. So, the Moors are putting this into, into effect. They're saying we have to create a condition whereby we allow people to elevate at a time when most Europeans and certainly the Roman Catholic Church were trying to put people to sleep in terms of really understanding who they were and their relationship with the world and with our creator. And for those of you who know something about names like Copernicus or Galileo, right? these are Europeans who were Catholics who got in trouble with the church because they were challenging the sciences that existed at that time. How dare you say that the earth revolves around the sun? Right? This kind of mindset of what I often refer to as this prescribed ignorance was done in order to maintain control of the masses, not to have people reach their potential to come into the knowledge of themselves. 17 universities, 70 public libraries in the 1100s. There was no equivalent in any other part of Europe. So you're talking about public education being made available to all, and you're talking about um, the larger structure, the political structure, controlled by the church at that time, trying to prevent this from happening.